Welcome to Dill's History Part 9. In this production I am going to try and give you a brief insight into the history of Dill from the landing of Julius Caesar to the early 1900s. Once again, pictures used will not be in conjunction with the story being told and will pass by randomly. I hope you enjoy watching. Deal's position with the Downs and proximity to the dreaded Goodwin Sands has made the town throughout its history a place of interest. Going back a few centuries, it is stated that Julius Caesar landed near here in the year 55 BC and a second landing by him was intended to be at Dover However, with the high cliffs and military presence there, he once again turned towards the north and landed at Deal. On landing, he was greeted by the locals, and it is said that he liked the place so much that he returned the following year on August the 26th, bringing with him 800 vessels and 27,000 men. Deal is also mentioned in the Doomsday Book as Adlam, a name which signifies low open land on the seashore. It is also stated that Dill was a parish in 1051. The town of Dill mentioned in the Doomsday Book is not the present town, but the piece of town known as Upper Dill. The population then consisted of a few poor fishermen who relied on fishing as their livelihood. After the Roman invasion, nothing of real importance affected Dill until 1215 when King John assembled his fleet in the Downs in order to deter the French who were threatening his crown. It is stated that a severe storm came in from the north and many ships were damaged or sunk. It was also in 1215 that England fought her first big naval battle off the North Foreland. On the 10th of March 1464, a woman was sentenced to be carried around the town by two porters, starting from Court Hall and going through the High Street and several other streets, to the cross in the Corn Market by Pillory Gate, and lastly to the Stone Cross, where she was banished, and if she returned she would be, she would be burnt in the cheek. And it is evident that six or seven hundred years ago, the Dill had a town hall, a corn market, and a pillory. In December 1539, Anne of Cleves landed at Dill on her way to be married to Henry VIII. During the same year, Henry began building of three castles, Dill, Warmer and Sandown. The purpose of these was for defence of the coast, as Dill was on such low-lying ground and easily approached. It was hoped the sight of these castles would deter the invader. Before the castles were built, there were five or six earth mounds in a line, from Warmer to Sandown, with cannons set on their tops. The castles were finished in the reign of Elizabeth. A troublesome period in time for Deal was in 1558, when the English lost Calais after having held it for over 200 centuries. Calais had been inhabited by settlers mainly from Deal and the Cinque Ports, and a substantial cross-channel trade had been well established, mainly in fish and agriculture produce. Many of the Deal merchants suffered badly when the French took Calais back. Deal was marked for consecration and defences when preparation was being made for the confrontation of the Spanish Armada in 1588. Large garrisons were drafted into the castles and a fleet of 63 fully equipped ships were anchored in the Downs ready for action. Six of these vessels were brand new and fitted out at a cost of £33,000 with the Deerlites paying the heaviest dues. During the years that followed Deal jogged along in quite a comfortable style, although it's important as a piloting station and a naval depot caused serious jealousies and bickering between local authorities of those of Sandwich. In 1640, the population of Deal was under 3,000, and on an old map, it only shows a few lines of houses coming down from Upper Deal towards the sea. In 1652, the Dutch War started, which saw, off the shore, the arrival of Admiral von Tromp 
with a broom at his masthead. Earthworks were built between the castles, and several companies of infantry and artillery were stationed behind them. The heyday of Dill's pre-Victorian prosperity was reached when the French war broke out, and from 1707 up to 1816 the town was a hive of activity, many being kept busy provisioning the fleets with equipment and stores. The naval yard was the principal government yard on the south coast and was a scene of continual activity. The naval yard was dismantled in 1863. The Downs was always full of shipping, first raters, cruisers, frigates and merchantmen of all kinds of rigs. Work was always plentiful and labour was highly paid with the demand for marketable goods unlimited. The amount of trade done in Dill before the war was declared on France in 1792 was said to be more than that done in all the other towns in East Kent put together. Property values went up and in the north end of the town new houses were erected by the dozens. Beach Street and Middle Street being close to the sea were important business thoroughfares where leading merchants had their stores and banks and where most of the inns and shops were located. The sales of ships chandlery, provisions, cables, anchors and chains was at a peak. There was also an active boat building industry which employed a large number of men. This industry was still going strong at the North End up until the early 1900s. Depression hit hard when peace came in about 1816. Rents from properties went down very fast and hundreds of families left the town through lack of work, leaving those that remained in a poor state and an average of 500 children toddled daily to the workhouse to be fed. Another blow to the town at this period came when the establishment set up the coast blockade to try and wipe out the smuggling. The smugglers, or free traders of the district as they were known, were a race unto themselves, that had been pursuing their calling for generations and were unstoppable. And it took years of action on the part of the government to convince them that the evasion of customs duty was illegal and would not be tolerated. Many stories are told about the bravery, cunning, revenges of these men. Smuggling has been going on in Dill for centuries and many stories can be read of accounts in the Downs. On one occasion, a coast guardsman was seized at his post, tied up in a sack and carried to the cemetery of St George's Church and left there to his reflections, while the smugglers landed a good cargo of tea and tobacco all duty free. It was also not uncommon for informers to be tarred and feathered, then drawn through the streets in the daytime in open carts as a warning to others. At the beginning of the 19th century, Dill was starting to recover from being played out. Railways, new industries and an upgrade in the whole area started to take place. It was no longer looked at as just a mere fish, fishing village. It had a favourable climate and an unrivalled location with more residential properties being built. Deal had gone from being a town with a collection of lodging houses with a pier and one policeman. There were now shops of every kind and the High Street was almost as good as Oxford Street along its full length. There were also many good shops in Victoria Road and Beach Street. The centre of the town was paved and well lit, which gave it a real distinctive appeal. The holiday maker was attracted by the seafront, with its promenades and long stretches of shingle, the shining sea and the regular passing of steamers, schooners, tugs, pilot boats and many other craft, the pier and the bandstand, 
the lifeboat stations and many curious inns, posh hotels and boating and fishing and bathing. The first interests along the foreshore are the castles, which were originally erected by Bluff King Hell, who, in his 32nd year of reign, placed them under the governorship of the Lord Warden of the Sank Ports. The Ill Castle is at the southern boundary of the town, close to the sea and a short distance from the high road between Deal and Warmer. The central tower is surrounded by four bastions with many portholes and the whole structure is surrounded by a moat with the drawbridge connecting the main entrance to the tower. The walls are about 20 feet thick at the foundation and taper off to around 11 feet thick at the top. Underneath the tower is a bomb-proof dungeon. Sandown Castle at the north end of Dill is now a ruin, having been taken down by order of the government in 1683. It was built to the same lines as Dill Castle, and its chief interest was that it was here that Colonel Hutchinson, one of Charles I's signatories, suffered a long and cruel imprisonment which ended with his death on September 11th, 1664. The pier was always the main attraction during the summer months and was erected in 1864 by Messrs Laidlaw and Sons, who were well-known Glasgow engineers. It was an ornate iron structure of around a thousand feet long and 27 feet wide, with two square pavilions at its entrance. At the seaward end, there was a large hall for concerts and a lower landing stage for embarkation of passengers from steamers. This was also a good pier for fishing. The depth of water on a spring tide was around 40 feet, and rarely less than 10 feet. The pier was considered the finest pier on the Kent and Sussex coast. It was ideal for a stroll, and the views from the end were magnificent. The old wooden pier, built in 1838, stood a bit to the north of the present pier, and adjoined the Royal Hotel. This collapsed in 1861, and no trace of it remains today. The bandstand, which was added on the seafront, stands very close to the pier approach, and it's here, during the summer months, that the band of the Royal Marine Depot and many other bands played music at frequent intervals. Deal was in those long ago days, when the wooden walls and hearty admirals passed by here and the Navy frequented the streets with their shiny hats and pigtails, a remarkable, interesting town with a big maritime heritage about it. Its stories of smuggling and Smuggler Bill and the excise men in centuries past, which can be read in many books, has now all gone and finished, or so it is believed. The Downs and the dreaded ship swallower called the Goodwin Sands with its history of shipwrecks and stories of heroism by the local boatmen, gallant and sad times, which can be read about in many books, thankfully now, rarely claim the unforeseen sailor. Dill fronts directly onto the Downs, midway between the North and South Forelands, and has uninterrupted views across the finest roadstead in the world, and on a really low tide, the Goodwin Sands can be seen whilst in the distance the coast of France is plainly visible. Deal holds a large history and has been built by the labours and falls of those that went before us. Remember Deal's past and the history that's left so as we can see what went before us. <laughs>